Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, fabulous to have you all here today. I, um, I was really excited to see the number of people who registered for the webinar today. Obviously, we've um, hit on a topic, and look, I'll, I'll be really honest with how these topics come along for us at our, uh, in our Real Schools webinars. They come out of conversation. And I've, I've always marvelled over the last couple of years, actually, at how many schools I've spoken to have had either, I guess, a an outdated approach to student leadership, which is sort of the same kind of approach that perhaps we had when more senior people, like perhaps myself, were at school, and that perhaps this is the one domain of, um, of education in schools that hasn't changed a great deal over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and I've also you know, found schools that don't have any real model for student leadership or they've just got a model I don't like. So um, I'm really excited today. I thought in bringing together this webinar, I didn't want to just sort of tell you what good student leadership programs look like um, because you can, and I shall, I'll give you a bit of information about that, but I didn't just want to do that. I didn't want to have a situation where, you know, you either just took this and, and, and then had to go, okay, I'm going to sort of start again and build yourself or I've got to, you know, find a way to, um, I've got to find a way to, you know, adapt this to our current system. I wanted to not only give you the information, but just give you something that you can run with, if you like, at the start as well. So um, that's where the webinar comes from today, uh, is out of conversations with people that this is a direct and pressing need. And I think that also what it comes out of is that so many schools around Australia are looking to do something about student voice. And um, I know that it's been my experience that with the various state and territory school review processes that come along, that when they do survey our students, one of the things that often comes back is that student voice returns quite lowly. Uh, I, I contend that this is the one form mechanism, the formal lever that you can just pull. You can get this done, do something about student leadership in your school, whether you're in a primary or a secondary phase or a middle, middle years phase of learning. Um, I would contend that this is something that you can do immediately that you, know, you can be pretty confident is going to have a direct impact on the way that students say their voice is heard in their school. So if you're here today because student voice is what you're looking for, then, uh, then I reckon you're in the right place. So look, today, I guess, I, I want to I wanna begin, I guess, by making the biggest mistake that any teacher can make. And that is that I would really like to, um, I, I'd really like to encourage you straight away to, to take the handout that's in there about the student leadership program that we've got in place. Uh, I think it'll provide you with a good little bit of, um, a good little bit backdrop for what we're going to talk about today. So where you can see the handout section on the control panel, I want you to grab that document now. Um, it's the biggest mistake a teacher can make because as you know in a classroom, if you hand out the, the worksheet or the task to the students before you provide instruction, that most of the time they're not listening to anything that you say. And uh, as a result, um, the engagement goes down. And I'm mindful that by telling you that you can download that straight away, that some of you might bugger off incredibly quickly. Uh, I'm going to bank on you that if you do download that SLC program straight away today, that um, I'm going to bank on you understanding that if you can get some tips and tricks around implementation, that will, will improve your dexterity to be able to to be able to um, build this as a uh, as a meaningful component of your school. So, um, so I just encourage you, hang around, but make their grown up learner decision that if you would like to download that SLC program, you're welcome to just take it straight away. Where do I come from? I guess I want to start by throwing a rock. Um, I, I have seen several schools where the SLC, the, our approach to student leadership or student representation. So I, I think that the, one of the things we've done is move from saying student representative council to student leadership body um, and we haven't changed much and what we end up with students doing is a hodgepodge of fundraising activities. Um, sometimes that's for the school and sometimes it's for external causes. I was recently at a um, at a school where they were, and the great part is that they were very mindful that they needed to do something uh, more powerful about student leadership in their school. But I noticed um, two kids with badges on. There was, a, uh, there was a female school captain and a male vice captain. And they were going from classroom to classroom with a jar that looked very much like this. And I, I, I said, oh, I said, what are, you, what are you doing with the jar of jelly beans? And they said, um, they said, oh, we're fundraising. 
And I said, okay. I said, how are you doing that? And they said, well, what kids have to do is they have to guess how many lollies are in the in the jar, and um, they get to they have to pay fifty cents per guess. And I said, okay. And then I said, then the winner gets. And they said, the winner gets the jar. And I said, okay, that sounds fair enough to me. Um, what are you fundraising for? And these two kids looked at me incredibly blankly, um, and they didn't have an answer. These were the leaders in the school who were running around fundraising, and they didn't know for what purpose they were doing it. They were doing it just because they were given a job, really. Now, I would contend to you incredibly strongly that that's not leadership. You know, leadership is not doing activities just because you were, do, you were told to do them. In fact, it's benign, blind followership. So we want to get our kids out of this notion that willy-nilly fundraising, and none of the causes that kids are fundraising for in schools around Australia are bad causes. So I say that this is a rock because it feels a little sometimes like I'm saying that, you know, it's a bad thing to do Red Nose Day or Yellow Ribbon Day or, you know, Jeans for Jeans Day, and I'm not. Um, they're all very worthy causes. I'm just saying don't fall for the trap of thinking this is leadership. And so what I'm advocating today is that leadership needs to needs to be something completely different. And what leadership, when we're really thinking about it in a school, needs to be is about growth and it's about improvement and progress. So what I want you to view student leadership as is not an opportunity to get some jobs done, but it's a genuine opportunity to grow and to improve and to have kids excited and motivated and inspired by progress in your school, um, such that the, the, um, the SLC, and I'll use that generic term for the sake of this webinar, um, such that the SLC becomes a genuinely worthy ambition for every single student in your school. Now, this whole notion of growth um, is one that doesn't come without warts on it. Um, a lot of people think that SLC is for the elite. It's our opportunity to reward the best kids, if I may put those in inverted, put that in inverted commas, um, in, in the school. And what we need to do is to encourage, or if I can put in brackets, even rig the election so that the kids who get into the SLC are the ones who can do the best job. I want to encourage you that if you're going to teach your kids about democracy is that sometimes you just don't get the democracy you're looking for. And what we do is we hope that the democracy will be good for the participant. So there are certainly some politicians at all three levels of, go of government in my areas, in the Mornington Peninsula and in Victoria and in Australia, who I wish weren't in parliament. And I do my bit in democracy to make sure they don't, but I have to accept that others want them there. And so it's really important that we sometimes make the democracy good for the, the politician. And in the same way, it's okay for the kid to be good for the SLC, but it's equally okay for the SLC to be good for the kid. In fact, if we are genuinely determined about growth, um, what we would be doing is encouraging the kids not to participate in a democracy purely on popularity. So what we don't want is a democracy um, that's based around, you know, who's the who's the the flavour of the month at the time that we actually ask them to write a couple of pieces of paper with people's names on it on a uh, and throw it in and throw it in the hat. What we'd like to do is talk to them about leadership. You know, what are the qualities that they're looking for, and then ask them to think about who are the people who are already doing that, who could really set a good example, and ask them for who are the people who you reckon have got potential. Who are the people who you think maybe aren't showing much of it, but they really could if we just gave them an opportunity gave them a little bit of title, gave them the responsibility to step up. It's certainly been my experience, I don't know about yours, but it's certainly been my experience that some of the kids I've taught who have been challenging, who've been, you know, pretty hard work, um, that they have, that they all have strengths, they all have hidden superpowers. And one of them is often responsibility. So I want you to think carefully about how you're gonna go about modeling and then deploying democracy in your school in order to get a student leadership council where it's good for the kid and the kid can also be good for the SLC. So I guess the other thing I wanna do now that I've sort of set the scene, that's my frame for student leadership before I get into detail. I'm gonna go from the broad to the specific today. I wanna to encourage you to get involved today. So a couple of ways that you can do that and it is one through the question box. So you can see in your control panel there, there'll either be a question or a chat box option, depending 
on which version of the GoToWebinar Citrix software you have available to you. And if you're in there, at the, um, it, when you go into that question box, I'd really love it if you would contribute to the, the webinar today. I would love to be able to drop some of this content on genuine context and to be able to solve the question for you today. So I encourage you to step up because there's just nothing worse than an unanswered question. Now, for me, it'd be horrible if you gave up you know, 45 minutes or so of your time today and um, at the end of it, you were still left with a question that, you did, that was going to prevent you from getting started. So if it's a question about the content today, whack it in there. Um, if it's a question about even accessing the webinar, I'm, I'm noticing just flicking through the, um, the attendee list today that there's some names that I've not seen before. So welcome. Great to have our first-time flyers with us as well as some of our frequent flyers. Um, and... If you, you know, if you today would like to participate, we would love to have you uh, have you step up and be involved. Um, another way that you can get involved is to put your hand up. So if you look on the control panel there, you'll see a little symbol of a hand. It's just like an old school classroom. Um, if you put your hand up, what I will assume is that you have something to say. And I have the facility here to be able to unmute you and you can make a verbal contribution to our webinar today. So a little word of warning to Greg Dyer that your hand is up. And if you'd like to put it down, I'll give you a moment to do it. Ah, oh, great. Well played, Greg. And, um, and what you can do, though, everyone, is put your hand up. And from time to time, I'll keep a little eye on that little column in my control panel. And if you'd like to make today conversational, then we would very much love you to do that as well. A little reminder. Don't, don't, let, a, don't let a question go unanswered today. So another, another way that you could get involved today is to participate in our polls. And I would really encourage every single person here to do just that. So I'm gonna launch a poll today that allows me to understand who are the people in the room today. So if you would have a look at the poll that's on your screen now and tell me what chair you're sitting in today when you're coming to learn about how student leadership can make a difference in your school. Are you a principal or a system leader in that AP role? Uh, we tend to get a lot of people interested in in this topic who are in that senior or leading teacher role, it tends to be, I think leading the SLC tends to be one of those jobs that once you hit a senior or leading teacher level, someone tries to hit you over the head with it and you go, oh dear, what am I gonna do with this? Um, so if you are in that role, then, um, then please let us know. I'll try and cut this off when we get to 80% of people who have voted and we're just about there now. And we've got a pretty clear trend happening here, which is really great. So I'll give you just a few more seconds and then I'm going to close that poll off. And I think that'll do me. So I'd like to be able to share these results with you so you know as well. So we've got a good smattering here, but we do have a lot of people, more than half of the people here that are in that AP or senior or, to, or leading teacher kind of role. So I'm going to keep that in mind as we progress through the webinar today. Um, just hide those results for you. And then what I would like to do is just go to the very next slide here and launch one more poll, if I may. Um, the poll that I'd like to ask here is what's your ambition for today? So I understand that some of you are here because you'd like to make student leadership approaches meaningful, not superficial. Um, what's the essay? Do you would like to have your student leadership positioned around building capacity rather than doing jobs? Would you like to make it an ambition for students so that kids actually want to get involved? Uh, would you like to make it because we don't want the student leadership to be around boring meetings and fundraising alone? Or do you know what? I'm just here because you offered me a free SLC program and just get me out of here as quickly as you can, mate. I, I get that that's why some people might be here. I know that you are time poor and time precious. So I get that that's what you're after. Like I said, I just encourage you if you're here for that reason to, uh, sure, download the doc and get out of here if you really must. Um, but I think that your dexterity in being able to implement will be better if you hang around and find out how we do it. Nearly there up to our threshold of vote. So if you've got that keyboard nearby, just give me one option so that I've got a really good understanding. Again, I can see a good trend emerging, so that really helps me. And I'll close voting there, share those results with you. So you know who's in the room. We've got you know, a, large a large response from people who are looking to make student leadership not so, not so superficial, but meaningful. And we're looking to make student leadership around building better leaders, not, not necessarily just getting some stuff done around the school. All right, that's really valuable for me to know. Thank you. I'm gonna keep that differentiation in mind as we move forward. All right, let's get into how you use this student leadership work. 
Um, when you do look at the, at the program, what you'll notice first of all is that there are three principles that sit behind it. Uh, the first one's probably the one that I'm gonna unpack in the most detail today. Um, depending on whether you've got questions around this, it, 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 this could be the, um, the, the, one of my quicker webinars. What, what we've done is we've gone and looked into a handful of, of skills and leadership behaviours that kids need both now to be effective leaders, what we find from young leaders are the things that are that are most prevalent in young leaders. And we've looked at some, some different research, both from the past and also what's changing in terms of young leaders. And then we've gone and sort of triangulated those two bits of data against what the groups like the Institute for the Future, um, that's a, a body that is, does some groundbreaking work in um, uh, out of the University of Phoenix in the United States. And they talk to work skills, what kids are going to need in the future to be able to collaborate and to be able to be, to be really honest, employable. Um, and what I really liked about their report is that they came out with 10 work skills from 2020 and beyond. And we've looked at a couple of them and gone, wow, there's things here that they will really need to know how to do. One of the, the key bits of research that we looked at was that what we do know, and most of us would be aware of, there's lots of stories that are showing up at the moment about artificial intelligence, uh, the rise of robots, and um, and what that means in terms of what the employability is going to be of our young people. And what they pointed to was things like, there are certain industries that if you can be replaced by a robot, you probably will be. Now, I don't mean to um, deter or frighten any laborers in the, <laughs> in the audience today, but if you're a brickie, then you might, might be a little concerned. There are some wonderful clips on YouTube at the moment of brick lane machines that are able to basically build a house within about 24 hours um, that would otherwise take eight people approximately three or four weeks to be able to do. They do it with more precision, more accurately, and more accurately, more cheaply. I think brick laying is one of those industries that's open to um, disruption by artificial intelligence and robots. What won't be open to disruption is industries like aged care. So what we know is that we're going to have an ageing aging population in the future. We're going to have people who will retire earlier. And we will also um, have a need there within that aged care industry for people to be cared by human beings. They won't want to be taken care of by robots. So that's why that, what leads us to, for instance, that, um, that sixth skill in there of being able to empathise. So that's actually teaching young people to know what it's what a certain situation is like for other people by being able to scan what their emotions are that they're exuding. Empathising is more than saying to somebody, "I know what the, I know what you're going through," because to be honest, that's sympathy. That's sympathy is about me, and empathy is very much about them. And so that's about saying, "Oh, it seems that you're really upset by this, or it seems that this is a much more comfortable way for you to do things." That's an empathic person knowing caring and taking weight, taking responsibility for the ways that our behaviours and our words and our actions directly impact other people. So, um, you know, this is tricky too because, you know, we've, for instance, have got uh, in many of our schools, you'll have certain, you'll have a, a certain cohort of kids who are on the autism spectrum and teaching them empathy is hard. Um, but they are capable, a lot of them, uh, of really good cognitive empathy, which means they can know that if I behave this way, it will have a negative impact on another person. If I swear in the workplace, it will have a negative impact on, um, on my employer and they may cease my employment on, as a result of that swearing. What they won't be able to do is what we call intuitive empathy, which is the ability to be able to see in somebody's face that they've upset them. They need to know the facts and not to be able to read between the lines, so to speak. So speaking specifically with kids about empathy, uh, we've certainly had kids who have been on the autism spectrum, who have been nominated and successful uh, in terms of becoming student leaders in their school. Uh, they provide a wonderful different perspective on so many different things because of the lenses through which they see problems and opportunities. So they're, they're incredibly valuable members of, um, of the SLCs that I've seen and been involved in. And, um, and while they may not become incredibly adept at the intuitive empathy, we do them a horrible disservice if we don't at least give them the opportunity to build that cognitive empathy 
and teaching them explicitly about it and letting them see themselves in that can be a really great way to do it. Um, and then those other skills you can see there, modelling is about making sure that we're talking to the kids about what sort of an example they set. And this is why it's more valuable for our kids, perhaps who we might think the SLC is going to be good for rather than them being good for the SLC. Modelling is, um, is something that the best we do in our SLC sometimes is to tell them that if they don't set a good example that we're going to take their badge off them. Whereas I would contend to you that it's a more productive thing to do to tell them exactly what modelling is specifically, get them to think about who are the people they've seen model effectively, get them to reflect on their current ability to model well and get them to make public commitments wrapped with support and encouragement and, uh, and accountability um, by the fellow mem SLC members. Um, I would rather get them to make those commitments and to get better and better at modelling behaviour rather than have them live under the, the shadow and threat that somebody's going to take their badge away if they don't set a good example. Um, and look, I won't, obviously you are all very capable of reading this list, so I'll let you um, just peruse that and see what those behaviours are. Um, one of the things that I, I love though is, I guess the last one I'll mention here is this notion of the second last behaviour there, which is to decide making principled and strong decisions even when they might not be popular is a hugely important leadership skill. What we need, um, I, I talk in a lot of my professional learning that I run with schools about a thinking frame that I ask people to deploy on the day and it's called KTFD. Um, so it's really about saying first of all K is for knowledge so I'm hoping that you leave a professional learning day with some new knowledge. Um, but they progress in terms of importance for me. So T is something that you think. I hope that at the end of a professional learning experience, that at the end of it, you'll think something. It'll be a bit unformed. It's not as sort of concrete as knowledge. Knowledge is something that you kind of go, yep, got that now, it's on my toolkit. Think is something that sort of, you know, wakes you up at 1.30 in the morning and you need to take notes about. I hope that my learning experiences create that for teachers. Um, F is something that you feel. So if you want, uh, the learning to be effective, it's important that we attach some sort of affect to it. The hierarchy around what people feel is um, is really interesting. Um, if you're going to attach positive affect to the learning, and that's what we're certainly trying to do with, with student leadership councils, if you're going to attach a really positive feeling, you learn more than if the content was just given to you or spoon fed to you. Second on the hierarchy is if you attach negative feeling. And what that means is that that's better than the third, which is you have no feeling. So it means that it's kind of better if people hate me in my delivery than it is if they think I'm boring and couldn't care less about me. So it's important to be sometimes a bit provocative around that. Um, but the fourth one is the D in the KTFD, which is to decide. Uh, the etymology behind the word decide is really interesting. It's actually the same as the the etymology behind some really nasty words like homicide and genocide and regicide and suicide. Um, when we side in any word, what we do is we kill off. Um, and when we decide, we kill off choice. So what we want is for our young people to understand that, you know what, there may have been some habits that you have had. There may have been some habits that we have had in our SLC or even some habits that we've had at a school. But when we see that we must decide to do it differently, we step calmly and confidently backing our principles across that line and we don't go back. We don't compromise because we kill off the choice to do it differently. And um, I think that's a really powerful metaphor for kids to be able to, to, be able to get their heads around. Um, so that's uh, SLC principle one, is to really get our heads into in a regular way. Do the kids know what these behaviours are? Do they know what a good example of them is? And then how is it that they could actually be responsible for making decisions that would allow them to get better at those behaviours? The second principle I want to talk to you about is community contribution. Now, I do, well, the reason I said to you earlier is that I, I, I value um, charities work and I don't, I've seen very few bad causes out there. I think too many people actually hesitate upon doing good in the world because they're trying to rank various causes and they waste time and it would just be better if they got out there and actually did some did something marvellous in the world. Um, so whether it's Jeans for Jeans Day or a Red Nose Day or Yellow Ribbon Day or Canteen or Kids Helpline or whether it's fundraising to build a new shelter over the canteen at the school, I really don't mind. I think it's more important that we're nimble about being doing good and also I think that it's important that we go deep.
we go hard. That's why I like this picture because it reminds me that when it comes to doing something in the community, it's about going all the way into the forest and not just taking a step in. Um, one of the examples of that, that uh, a school where I was a, uh, uh, I guess I, I sort of spoke to myself a little bit earlier on when I said uh, put in a senior teacher position. The first time I was given a senior teacher position in a, in a school, I was given the SLC bag to carry. And, um, and instead of fundraising several times in a superficial kind of way, we went deep on one. The students of the school in the SLC had a bit of a chat about what sort of charity they would like to support. And they came up with a list of six different charities. And um, there were some... Amongst the, I guess, the charities, it's not always just a charity either, um, you can have global uh, causes. So that could be that you want to you know, raise money for, you know, for Greenpeace or World Vision or, you know, one of those big, um, big uh, you know, almost, you know, I was about to call them companies, but they're not, you know, um, one of those big not-for-profits. Um, you could then choose a, um, a community a group to follow, so that might be a, an Australian or a Victorian or a you know a local group that are that are making a difference, or it could be even a very local group, such as within your school, so trying to do something positive within your school. And the truth is, I don't mind as long as we go deep, as long as we go, we step right into that challenge. Um, so when our students identified a variety of those, six of them, there was a couple of global, couple of couple of national, and a couple of local opportunities. They then went around and surveyed the rest of the students in the school about which one they wanted to do something for. And what came back was that they wanted to help Kids Helpline. Now, Kids Helpline, you know, have various ways that they fundraise. But when we approached them and said, "Look, our kids want to do something, but they don't want to just wander around the room." The, the school and sell ribbons. Um, we want to do something big and proper and have everyone go to the effort. These kids organised a genuine one day fate in the school with many, many, many different activities that went around the school. That every time they, they got to these, these activities, it was just a silver coin donation to be able to participate. So there was Facebook painting and there was a big um, fantastic kids helpline mural that you had to pay with a silver coin to be able to sign the mural and we sent we took great photos with that and sent it off to um, sent, sent it off to kids helpline as well you know, and all sorts of really just fantastic fun activities but boy they worked to organize that day I think that that was probably six months worth of work with kids out there looking for donations, running raffles, setting up tables, setting up, uh, you know, booking equipment and, and just doing everything they can to really organise something really meaningful and special. And the wonderful part about that is that they learn how to make a genuine contribution, not a superficial one. And secondly, they learn more deeply about the cause. They learn why Kids Helpline exists. They learn how many kids they help all, you know, every single day. Um, and they learn what it would be like, for instance, or what the negative impact might be if Kids Helpline didn't exist. So um, going deep when it comes to community contribution is what I really want to encourage you to make a, make a hallmark of the way that you work. And then the, the third thing, that, the third principle that sits behind a really fabulous student leadership council, it goes back to the old days of representation. And that's about how we meet. How is it that we come together and share the problems, the issues, um, the hopes, and, um, and the challenges and the opportunities that are coming to improve our school from our student body? So what's the way that we meet so when you have a look through the, the program that I've provided for you today, uh, you'll see that what I advocate is that you alternate meeting type, which means that if, you can, if you're capable of getting together once a week, fine. If you can only do it once a fortnight, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I want you to alternate meeting type, which means that one meeting will be around representation, bringing those ideas we could be working also on our community contribution, working on issues and problem solving and making key decisions. Um, but it can also, your alternate meeting needs to be back to principle one, which is about leadership behaviours and doing the work involved in reflecting on those. I'll give you an example of that in, in just a moment. Um, so having a structure for that, uh, you will, you'll see that structure within the, the SLC program. So that structure includes things like who's going to you know, be chairing the meeting, what does it mean to be chairing the meeting, who's going to be recording the minutes, who's going to be typing the minutes, for instance, who's going to be distributing those, 
you know, who's going to be oh, I'm a, an advocate of having an action sheet. So there's not the, the minutes is a record of the conversation. The action sheet is the other things that are going to be done. So an action, a good action sheet will include, you know, a name of someone who's responsible, a timeline and very specific information about what's going to be done and, uh, and who's going to be providing support. So it's very specific around making sure that we do something between meetings. I actually think it's really important for student leaders not to think that the SLC is an opportunity to meet with other cool people, even though it is. Um, we, don't, we don't want them to think that it's just that. We want them to know that there is work, uh, worthy work. There's worthwhile things to do in between. So having a structure for the way that you meet when you do the representative part of, um, of the SLC is a hugely important thing because you don't want SLC to just be a talk for best. We really want to be productive and we want them to learn how to collaborate effectively themselves and having them responsible for running the meeting. And I certainly would advocate for facilitators of SLCs, for leaders of them in a, in a staff, that they take the Vygotsky approach to, uh, to running your meetings, which is gradual release of responsibility. At the start, it's okay to guide hard. And my ambition is that in, with any student leadership group that I work with, that by the time I get to halfway through the year, that I can basically attend those SLC meetings and sit on the outside of them and make almost zero contribution because I've taught them how to be able to do that effectively. Um, I did mention that in the meetings as well, that it's worth getting behavioural and about each of those behaviours that I mentioned before. So in the, in the program, you'll see that there's a reflection sheet for every single behaviour that we're suggesting you talk about. So what you can see there is that we define the behaviour, we tell them what that means. We then give them a quote. Uh, it's nice to have a quote sometimes just to, to hang your thinking on. Um, kids are you know, increasingly inspired by, I'd love to say they're inspired by quote, but really they come from memes. Um, so a quote that maybe has been taken from a meme can be a really interesting, um, I don't know, just a prompt for them to be able to make sense of what we mean by that definition. Sometimes, you know, defining can be quite a dry thing to do. Important, foundational, but dry. Uh, the quote adds a bit of colour and um, allows them to start to place it in their own experience and perhaps in their own school as well. Uh, and then we ask four key questions. And you'll see through the program that they're reasonably similar questions. So we ask them, how well do you believe you model positive behaviours and attitudes? You know, well, how, do you, how do you reckon you're going? I'm often, when I run this activity asking them to put a score in there you know, give them so give yourself a score out of 10 and then when it comes to modeling and setting a really good example asking them to nominate a hero is really important i think that around any behavior you know we we don't want to think that our heroes are heroes in everything nor do we want to think our villains are villains in everything so i'm often saying that from a, a st even if i step away from slc's for a moment to a staff and a, uh, a communication with parents in the community point of view is I'm always telling people you need to communicate you know my message around communication is and my, my hero sorry around communication is Andrew Bolt now I can't stand Andrew Bolt the writer for the Herald Sun here <laughs> and all that I don't like almost everything that he writes but what I love about him is his ability to write as though he's an expert his ability to get people's attention by making it making us believe that he has studied this topic incredibly deeply. And, um, and I think that's important for us in schools. So asking them not to think that their hero, for instance, for every one of the behaviours, we'd like them to think that they'll be able to pick someone different because we can see this behaviour shining in that hero. So I ask them questions like that. You know, where, which hero do you see this behaviour shining in? Somebody who sets an awesome example. So what we don't want here is them for them to, you know, for instance, choose a, a rather misbehaved rugby league player or pop star or celebrity, you know, reality TV, um, you know, a hero from Married at First Sight or some other similar <laughs> publication. Um, what we want them to do is to think about which hero really sets a fantastic example, demonstrates for others the sort of things that we wish to see and, um, and is very visible in that. Now they can talk about people that they see in the media, people that are famous. They also tend to start talking about people from their own school and families who were their heroes when it comes to this stuff, which is perfectly valid. Um, we then ask them, what's one thing you could do to improve modeling good choices? You know, what, what, what's the, because we don't want them to think that, you know, oh, you know, we don't want them to write something 
boring like a, uh, a goal that says get better at modeling good choices. You know, now, what's the one thing you could do that would improve modeling good choices? I had a student say to me once that um, the one thing he would do to model be better, better choices would be that when he's playing cricket at lunchtime with his mates, he will start to accept the umpire's decision when he's out. Now, well known was he for throwing the bat um, as part of throwing a well-orchestrated tantrum. And um, but mainly because he was just one of those cricketers. I think I play with a couple of these cricketers who were never out. They just think that there should be a playground direct review, um, umpire review system, and um, that he should be proven to, that he could be batting all the way through lunchtime, every lunchtime. Um, and he just said, the one thing he's going to do is just, I'm going to model that when you, you accept the umpire's decision. Now, he wouldn't change anything else. That was it. But we need traction when it comes to um, improving behaviour, not perfection. So um, a really important thing for him to be able to do. And then when have you seen modelling positive behaviour have a real influence on others? So we kind of ask the question here, which is the WIIFM question, which is what's in it for me, which is asking them, when have you seen it work? When have you seen it really, really take off when people set a really great example? When have you seen a benefit or a kickback to you or what you're trying to get done by modelling really great behaviour and getting them to talk, to think, to write, to draw, and even better, to make decisions about what they're going to do in that space can be a, a really useful thing to do. So, um, look, the last thing I want to suggest to you is it's rather boring, um, if I'm really honest. Um, and it's really about making sure that your ducks are in a row before you go. So I'm, I'm delighted to see that so many people have downloaded the handout, the, um, the, the program as a handout today. I just want to encourage you before you fly out, organise your SLC or, or organise your first meeting or, or whatever, that you think about the artefacts that you're going to need to support that. I, I am big on... I think that the SLC is the one area where we don't need to go so electronic. We don't need to go online. I think that having building for your kids an SLC folder with all the pages from the program that you built today and making them responsible for having a folder to attend a meeting is a great way to foster responsibility. You can also use the folders for the kids to do things like print and store minutes, um, have the, the minutes and um, and um, action sheets and things like that available so that they can use them when it's their turn to do so. And I want to encourage you, just take your time and bother to get that organised. It had been handed a folder as a student leader is a wonderful way to emphasise for the students that this is important. This matters. They say if you want to look busy, you know, carry a clipboard and walk quickly. Um, and I think this, uh, you know, behind every a little um, a little saying like that, there's an element of truth. And I would love your kids to know that it's important and that this will make them busy, but it's worth doing. Uh, think about uniforms as well. Um, it is important that our leaders are treated and look special, you know, that they have been given the opportunity to, um, you know, uh, have their wonderful authority that they earn not by being authoritarian but by being authoritative, that they earn because they highly respect and value the trust that others have placed into them by, by voting themselves in. Um, it, it's nice to be able to recognise that in the yard. I think we are going to be serious about even that first behaviour of modelling, that sometimes just having a different uniform on can, um, can be a really valuable reminder for these kids for whom we want the SLC to be good for, uh, can be a really valuable reminder for them that indeed we are watching and they are being watched, they are being seen. Um, the next one for me would be around letters. I, I, I think get organised in terms of sending each successful student a letter about what it means to be in the SLC and indeed sending their parents a letter about what we're expecting of them is a, is a really clever thing to do. And then the last one for me is get your timetable organised. I've seen too many SLCs fail because we haven't adequately prioritised it within the timetable. And so we, we cancel meetings readily. It's the first thing that gets cancelled if something else gets in the way. Um, it, it's being placed in an area that is a low priority, you know, popping it in a lunchtime on a Monday where all of our public holidays go um, and over a lunchtime where the students don't really want to give up their lunchtime anyway can be something that places the importance of the SLC too low. So I really encourage you to think 
carefully, carefully about the timetabling of your SLC meetings so that they're, um, they're activities that, 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 that the kids really want to go to. And the other little component of timetabling effectively, of course, is to make sure that you timetable it in such a way that somebody in your school wants to lead this SLC. So providing some additional release or support for somebody to be able to do that can be a great way to make your commitment to an SLC, thereby your commitment to an improvement in student voice, a real and palpable commitment. Okay, look, I, I've talked an enormous amount today, <laughs> and I must admit I sort of lied a little, little bit about questions and, um, and about hands up. I haven't stopped as regularly as I'd like to to have a look. So what I think I might do here just at this point is encourage you that if you do have a question, pop it in because I'd really like to um, chew on one or two of them before we finish up today or even put your hand up. While you're thinking about that or perhaps even typing, I want to give you a little sneaky, um, sneaky early bird option. We're going to run some public events um, that aren't related to student leadership, but I think will be of genuine interest to you uh, over the next, um, in, in a couple of months' time, in two or three months' time. Uh, we're going to run them at one end of the country and at the other. <laughs> so we're going to run them in Melbourne and in Darwin. And um, we're running a one-day restorative practices training opportunity for people called restorative classrooms, strong classrooms. Um, I think it'll really change the way that you participate and that you practice in the classroom. So if you head along to the Real Schools website, either now or after the webinar, um, you'll see that we've just today launched our web pages for these and you can register straight away. We haven't gone live with this yet, which means that I haven't gone and publicised this yet. So if you want to take an opportunity to get involved in, in the Restorative Classroom, Strong Classrooms workshop, then I strongly suggest you get involved now. We don't book big rooms, and the main reason for that is this is not a conference. Um, this is an opportunity to work with other colleagues to work through that methodology of KTFD, where you will leave having been supported and made accountable to some key shifts in the way that your teachers are going to practice. Um, and if you'd like to come along to the Leading School Culture, we want to run a... We, we want to have um, some information for, available for people about uh, how you can step into understanding what it means to lead the culture of an organisation and perhaps, if I may speak so frankly, not just be a victim of it. Um, so really important, um, uh, really important that if, that if that's your bag, if you're in a aspiring leader, senior teacher, AP principal type role, um, take note of that opportunity. It's a... It's a challenging kind of day. It's a day where you'll really get your hands dirty and you'll leave with a plan. You'll leave with a plan for how you're going to tackle creating the sort of culture that will allow your programs to thrive in the school. Um, really want to encourage you to think about getting involved in those before all those seats are snapped up. And I just thought today was a nice opportunity to give you that early bird opportunity. Madeline, I want to thank you for your question. You've said, can you have some more information about what you might put in a letter to send home? So if we're sending home a letter to parents, then I would be letting them know that it is an incredible honour. I would be using lots of words like honour and prestige and privilege about uh, the role of being a school leader, I would tell them about those three principles. That first of all, we'll be working on leadership behaviours. Secondly, we'll be working on making a genuine, deep contribution of the community. And thirdly, that they will be learning how to represent the student body of the school and they will be required to step up and voice up the concerns of the, the concerns and the ideas of the student learning leaders in their school. So I'd make it very clear that that's what's involved. I'd also make clear some of the things that parents can help them from a responsibility point of view. So how you, it would be great for, I'd be encouraging parents to speak to their child at home about how their leadership's going. So that means tell them about the 10 behaviours. Um, and you might even choose to do little things like you know, send home a, a text message or an email that says that today we spoke about what it means to you know, make decisions. And, um, and that way the parents can talk to them about it at home. And I think you need to let them know that you're deadly serious about things like you don't come to the meeting unless you've got your folder. And if you lose your folder, then it's your responsibility to come and see the SLC coordinator who will hand you the USB with the, the files on it and you go and print them for yourself. You know, you go down to the news agents and buy yourself another folder and take the responsibility of fixing it up when there's a problem that you've caused. So letting them know what the expectations are, letting them know what the potential benefits are and letting them know what support they can provide is what I would put in that letter. Uh, a couple of other uh, questions here before we finish. 
Uh, Greg's asking, Adam, do you know any research which points to the increase in student wellbeing to the, due to the ability to have a voice within their school? Greg, I can't think of one off the top of my head, like a, a study that I could link you to right now. Um, all I can say is that I do know that for many of the student surveys that are used around Australia, that there are several questions that are categorised under the heading of student voice. And, um, and when we elevate student voice, we can record better data and obviously celebrate that data. Uh, I'll go and have a look, Greg, and if I can find something that directly points to student wellbeing and student voice, then um, I'll have a look and see if I can find something for you. And uh, Bolinda, you wanted the handout now, you've seen it, Belinda, got it, excellent, glad you got it, glad you got it. Okay. Um, to finish things off, everyone, um, next steps, please remember, the other uh, handout that you've got in the webinar today is the slide deck from today. So if you think that will support you in implementing today, please make sure in the last couple of minutes that we've got together today that you download that slide deck. If you need to talk about this with us, or if you want to talk about the, the workshops that are coming up, or if you think that, um, that, that you'd like to have a chat about even our real schools partners that have been implementing this work along with the RP work, along with the leading school culture work. Um, just in the chat box there, just write the word chat in the, in the chat box, in the question box, write the word chat and, um, and we'll just follow up with it to see if you'd like to have a, have a conversation. So if there's anything that you want to talk about, um, we'll follow up and make sure that we have a yarn. And of course, what I do want you to do is to make sure that you download that free SLC program today as well. So don't leave without that in your pocket. Hey, the, the next webinar we're going to run is going to be run by Ryan. And Ryan, um, Ryan has begun uh, working with schools around a, a 12 month commitment that we call evidence empowered, evidence empowered schools. And one of the key components in that is how you can power up genuinely getting people excited about reading in your school. So Ryan's big belief is that the place to start if you're looking to become a genuinely evidence empowered school is around improving your reading data. And this webinar is all about how do you engage the big players across your school community. So we're talking here about that powerful triad, getting people on the same page between students, um, teachers and parents. And I, I love the work that Ryan's doing in this space. So what we'll do after this webinar today is send you a, a link to be able to register for that webinar. It's on April 19th. And, um, and I just want to highly encourage you to get along to that one. Ryan really, really knows his stuff in this space. Okay, one last check. I'm just going to make sure that nobody's got a hand up and there's no extra questions there. All right, awesome, awesome, awesome. That That's our details to get in touch, guys. Thank you so much. I really... Um, I really appreciate uh, you all giving up some of your time to find out about this today. I know how time poor and how time precious you all are. Um, if we can help in any way, then please get in touch. Enjoy the rest of your week and enjoy what's left of term one as you move towards a well-earned break. We'll see you next time. <laughs>